All right, good evening. We're going to get started in uh, the book of Titus. We're going to continue where we left off last week. This week we're going to be studying the book of Titus, chapter 1, and we're going to go through verses uh, 10 through 16. Today is June 2nd, uh, Friday, 2017, and we're going to get started in there. If we would, if we'll open up our Bibles, we're going to read verse 9. And we're going to read the first couple of verses, then we'll get into a word of prayer. And then we're going to get started with our lesson for tonight. But we'll see in Titus chapter 1, verse 9. It says, Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. And so what we'll do is we'll get uh, started in verse 10 in just a moment. But we'll open up in a word of prayer, and then we'll get started. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're thankful for this day of grace where we can study your word rightly divided, allow your word to work effectually in us as we believe it. Lord, we're thankful for the opportunities we have in this whole dispensation of grace as your ambassadors with the ministry of reconciliation, that we can go forth and see souls saved for your glory. Amen. Amen. So, as we continue with our study of the book of Titus, we go into verse 10. We left off, I believe, in verse 11 last week. We're just backing up a little bit and then going forward with the rest of the chapter. But we see, it says, For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they the circumcision. We remember from our study last week, the Apostle Paul was telling the Galatians that he also was warning them of the circumcision as the Judaizers came into uh, Galatia, brought, tried to bring them back under the law, and they actually succeeded at some point. He also tells them in, in the book of Philippians, beware of evil workers, uh, uh, dogs, things like that, and, and warns them concerning um, you know, the, the circumcision as well. And so we see various examples in other books where Paul warns concerning the circumcision. We see that there. And as we continue, we'll see in verse 10, Paul's warning Titus. Paul tells Titus early in this chapter. He begins his introduction and he gives an explanation. He tells him, Titus, here's what you're here to do. Those two things. Set up elders and and um, set in order the things that are wanting. Those two things in Titus chapter 1 verse 5. And then he gives a description, some characteristics. Set up elders. And here's what you need to look for in setting up elders. Now as we're in verse 10, he's saying, watch out for these guys. Watch, here's a description of things you need to watch out concerning these guys. And we saw, for there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. So we're seeing him make a description of that. And so what, we, what we're seeing, as we get into verse 10, we're seeing a description of, of some of these, these men that Titus needs to watch out for. And so we're seeing that the, the, love, the love of the world overrules their, their love of Christ concerning uh, unruly and vain talkers and deceivers. They would rather be approved of the world. They would rather have the praise of men. They would rather have, uh, be, they'd rather be accepted of men than have a worthy walk in Christ. And as we learn something from this and apply this into our life, we know that that's not what we're looking for when we're down here as well. We're not going to be accepted. Uh, let's see how I say this. We're not going to have a good day at the judgment seat of Christ. That's a better way to put it. We're not going to have a good day at the judgment seat of Christ if we're looking to be accepted by every by every man, woman, and child that we're seeing out there, especially those that are unsaved. What we need to be standing on is the wise master builder, Paul, his doctrine, his information, and go forward with our ministry in the word rightly divided, understanding Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. And the doctrine is built on that. And we see that here. Um, in the book of Titus, in all of Paul's epistles, as he presents that and explains that. So that means we need to study that. And Paul says that in 2 Timothy 2.15, that we need to be studiers, and that we need to be students. So, we also see that they take uh, these men in verse 10, many unruly and vain talkers, they can, we know many unruly and vain talkers, they can take the scriptures, and they can take it twisted for financial gain. They can take it for gain. And they can say that gain is godliness. They can take the scriptures and they can say, they can go to any book, any verse, any book, and they can say, well, 
God gave me this car, and God gave me this job, and I thank God that he gave me uh, this and that and this and this and here and there. And When God's not doing that today, God is allowing all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. God's not giving people cars. God's not giving people jobs. God's not giving people money, although that's something we need to do. We need to uh, earn a paycheck and pay the bills, and we need to do other things in, in life that are that are considered good works. But it's not for our salvation that we're doing these for good works. It's because we just need to be a productive member of society. We need to be proactive. We need to go forward and do that which is right. Because we have to abide by a certain behavior that Paul talks about in his epistles concerning the body of Christ. And so we see that in his epistles here. But when you see about many unruly and vain talkers, you'll see that they'll take the scriptures and twist them. If we look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 5, and they'll say that gain is godliness. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 5, and we looked a little bit at this last week. Because this is the Apostle Paul warning Timothy as he sets him up, helps him out, gets him started and stabilized, and says, and warns him, he says, hey Timothy, you better look out for perverse, or perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyself. So he's telling them in verse 5, these men are destitute of the truth. They don't know the truth. They don't have the truth. They're destitute of the truth. And one qualification of them is that they're supposing that gain is godliness. Because you can go back in the prophetic scriptures for Israel, you can see where God would bless them with with um, cars, with, well, with, with <laughs> not necessarily cars, but God would bless them with land. Yes. God would bless them with with uh, cattle. God would bless them with rain. God would bless them with you know, men and soldiers and fight their battles for them. God would do that for Israel because it's all about inheriting the earth. And the only way to inherit the earth is to have someone who can help you do that fight your battles and win your wars and give you things and set you up and get you give you a kingdom from heaven to earth. And that's exactly what Israel will get. And on top of that, all their priests will be completely healed and be able to walk the earth, doing what they need to do, giving out Israel's ministry. You can't walk this planet being sick. So that's why Israel requires healing so they can walk the earth or vice versa. People can come to them and they could be uh, healed as such. Well, first, Israel needs to get into that kingdom. And so that's a whole other study for a whole other issue. But what we're seeing here is that today, people will suppose that gain is godliness. And they, they never got out of that prophetic program. They never separated prophecy from mystery. They never rightly divided the scriptures and understood that that's not what God's doing today. And it's not about health. It's not about wealth. It's not about prosperity. It's not about these things. And what we're seeing in verse 10, and there are many in the book of Titus, but there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers. And he says to Titus, especially they the circumcision. So we're seeing that there and that they, they'll also compromise to avoid persecution. So these are vain talkers. They'll be happy to compromise on any doctrine. If it, if it avoids persecution on their part, if they, if they can avoid it, they won't hold fast the faithful word as they've been taught which is what Paul tells Titus to do, which is what Paul tells Timothy to do, which is what Paul tells the body of Christ to do. Hold fast on what you believe. Hold fast. Stand firm. What we're seeing here is um, these vain talkers can easily compromise and say, you know, as long as you don't persecute me, I, I believe what you believe, and you believe what I believe, and, and it's all the same. And we know that's not true. That's not true. If it's not what... Paul's saying is going on today, it's not what God's doing today, then it's not, it has to be rightly divided. And number one, if that's, if, if it's biblical, and just because it's biblical doesn't mean it's what's happening today. And if it's not, if it's outside of the Bible, and people say, well, God's talking to me and God's telling me things, that doesn't even mean it's even in the Bible. It just means it's in their head. Who knows where that's coming from? So... <clears throat> All of this can be just a matter of someone vainly talking. They can be talking to themselves. They can be talking, trying to talk to you, trying to convince you of something. And you're the one who has to convince them, as we see from the book of Titus. So, 
what we're seeing here is he's saying, for there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they in circumcision. So, as we continue on, he says, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. So we're seeing it's all about money in verse 11. And we studied this verse last week. But it says there, whose mouths must be stuck, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not. So what Titus has to be on the lookout for, these vain talkers in verse 10, these unruly people in verse 10, is that they're going to be teaching something. So these are teachers Paul has to be looking out for. These are unruly, vain speakers and talkers who can teach. So when you see a teacher, someone says, I'm a teacher of the Bible, and they're speaking vainly, and they're speaking uh, wrong information and, and crazy information, and information that does not match up, don't let that be a shock to you, because you're seeing it in the book of Titus, where Paul's saying just because they say they teach doesn't mean it's not vain, doesn't mean it's not unruly, doesn't mean it's not information that is uh, deceitful, because Paul's telling Titus, I'm, I'm, t I'm telling you to... Uh, be ready for it. <clears throat> Tell you to be ready for it and to watch out for it. So, and so it says, whose mouths must be stopped, teaching things which they ought not. Now we can think, if we look at our own society, what are some things that people are teaching which they ought not? You could say tithing, healing, Catholicism, religion, uh, Jehovah Witness, I mean, traditions of, men. traditions of men, you can go on and on. Water baptism, you can go on and on about things that people are teaching which they ought not. And that's going on today, that's going on right now. But people who are completely oblivious to how this book is to be read, Prophecy for Mystery and Rightly Divided, they have no idea. They have no idea. If they hear a Bible verse, they think, you know, oh, well, that's amazing. Yeah. That you would know something from the book of Exodus, something from the book of Habakkuk, and something from the Apostle Paul. Mm -hmm. When really, you've got to know how to read it, the proper context, and you have to rightly divide it. Because they said that it's in the Bible, so whatever in the Bible is right. Yeah, yeah, but they'll say if it's in the Bible, yeah. They'll say if it's in the Bible, it must be right. Mm -hmm. And there, that's true, it is correct. But the context yeah. of what's being said, the, the way it's written. Yeah. So even if we read the book of Habakkuk, which we should, it's right, mm -hmm. but it's not for us today. Yeah. We have to know where it fits, why it fits, to whom it's speaking to, and everything else. And it's proper context, right? They divide it. So, but what Paul's saying is that the, these people's mouths must be stopped in verse 11, because they can subvert whole houses. People can come in, sit down and have a conversation with everybody and, 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 and uh, shipwreck the faith of everybody in the whole house. Mm -hmm. Subvert them. And teach things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. So you can have signs and wonders and miracles and healings and everything else. And those are things which people need, they need to just, you need to teach by sound doctrine to keep their mouth shut. And we need, that needs to be taught to them. You need to teach them, keep your mouth shut, you don't know what you're talking about. You need to understand this Bible rightly divided in its proper context. Go back to square one, go back to salvation, and let's grow you back from there because you never got it right the first time. Mm -hmm. So just because you can quote a Bible verse, I mean, the devil can quote a Bible verse, the, the devil can quote quite a, quite a many bit of Bible verses. And he's not afraid to do so, he's got no problem with it. It's putting it in its proper context so that the power of God can see his soul saved through Paul's gospel. That's what he doesn't want. The devil doesn't care if you read Genesis to Revelation all day long. But if you know how to read it yeah. and what you can do with it, that's a problem for him. Because now you're getting people saved. And he doesn't want that. So, as we continue, uh, let's see, we've got... Uh, whose mouths must be stopped in verse 11, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. And in verse 12, one of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. So he's saying, we see in verse 12, one of themselves, even a prophet of their own. So apparently on, their, on, their, on this island of Crete, there's a prophet uh, of, of the Cretans. The Cretans are false prophets. You know, they've got their own 
different religions that they've set up, and one of the creation's prophets that they've set up, a self-appointing prophet or a prophet that the creation's felt should be a prophet. There's many people here in, in Central Florida that think they're prophets. They're not prophets, but they think they are. Well, apparently, he says, one of themselves, even a prophet of their own, it's not one of God's prophets. It's, one, it's a prophet of their own. It says, one of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, the creations are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. So apparently the self-appointed prophet doesn't like the creations very much. And yet he's a creation prophet, quote-unquote. Well, the point is, what we're saying there, verse 13, he says, this witness is true, wherefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. So the first thing he's saying about this person, he's saying about what he's saying, <clears throat> verse 13, he says, this witness is true. So he's saying, I, I agree. I agree. He says that the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. Essentially what the Apostle Paul is saying, yeah, this witness is true. The witness is true. The Cretan prophet may not really be a prophet, but what he's talking about is right. The Cretans are evil beasts, slow bellies. So the Apostle Paul doesn't think highly of the civilization of the island of Crete. He's saying, I agree with this false prophet. He's saying this witness is true. He's saying they're always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. And so we can see that if we look at those three descriptions in verse uh, 12. He says the Cretans are always liars. And we know that. We can look at Romans 16, 18. Because we dealt with this a little bit in the book of Romans. And in Romans chapter 16 and verse 18, where, where we're seeing the Apostle Paul talked to Titus, saying that they're always liars. No matter which way they go, they're always liars. They're, they're, they're liars. Romans 16, 18 says, and the Apostle Paul is talking and warning the Romans about this. He says, They that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. So what we're seeing is that he's, is that he's, he's warning them. Um, you know, they, they, they're pretty much deceiving the hearts of the simple because they're liars. And so liars are out to deceive, and they're out to deceive the hearts of the simple. And when we go back to Titus, we're seeing the same thing that he's mentioning there. He's saying, even the prophet of the own said, the creations are always liars, so they could deceive just the same way, with good words and fair speeches. And he says, evil beasts, which pretty much is saying they're just acting like animals, they're acting like evil animals, wild animals. You know, for self-gratification, for self, they're all about self, these these. Yeah, your evil creations. These, these, they're acting like wild animals. These guys, they're they're liars. They're acting like you know, they're all about themselves. You know, they're just pretty much uh, no control, no understanding, just self preservation, self gratification. That's the attitude of these uh, animals. Is what he's saying. These evil beasts, as he describes it, and he says slow bellies. And we can go back to that Romans sixteen eighteen. And see more again where he says, you know, slow bellies. And we saw, as we saw before, he said, uh, For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. So we're seeing serving their own belly is going to be for those selfish motives again. They're all about themselves. They're all about serving their own belly, about, you know, taking care of their own selves only. And uh, pretty much doing things what they want uh, for their own self. And... They're pretty much pampering themselves when we see, you know, slow bellies. So it's going to be about themselves. And we see that there. In verse uh, 12, when the, when the Apostle Paul describes this to Titus, and he describes, describes it by those three words, by those three terms. And so that's why he says, this witness is true concerning the Cretans. He says, wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. So you see where Paul's instruction to Titus is to rebuke them sharply. So this is the description that we read about the Cretans in verse 12. 
And he even agrees with the false prophet, saying, you know, these guys are, are, are wild animals, liars, slow bellies, selfish, that type of thing. He says, rebuke them sharply. You know, hit them hard, in other words. Don't, don't just go up to them and be gentle and say, you know, you need to do this, you need to do this. Rebuke them sharply, is what he's saying. Get them with, with sound doctrine. Don't just start yelling for no reason. Get them with sound doctrine and rebuke them sharply. So that, you know, they get shocked at what they're hearing and they, they grow in the truth and they understand that there's something to be serious about, mm -hmm. which is God's word rightly divided, understanding Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. So when the Apostle Paul says that, he's saying rebuke them sharply. And so you will hear people in the grace, even in the grace movement, say, well, you know, you're not supposed to, you know, yell at people. You're not supposed to be rude to people. I wouldn't do that 24-7. But when the occasion calls for it, the Apostle Paul says, if this is your audience, and they're selfish, and they're rude, and they're mean, and they're all about themselves, and they're evil beasts, and they're slow bellies, and they're always liars, rebuke them sharply. You let them have it. If that's their attitude, mm -hmm. you're not going to win them over by just being nice and letting them have their way with you. You need to start you know, going to them and let, let, them, let them know it. Mm -hmm. And so that's what the Apostle Paul said. That's a good learning, extremely good learning lesson to understand. There's times where when you discern the, the audience, if someone really wants to learn, you can be kind to them and then teach them and, and, and handle it in a gentle manner. But when someone is having a vain attitude or a I don't care attitude or a I don't care about you or God or life or death or anything, you can rebuke them sharply. And, and teach them the manner of such, because Paul did, because he's telling Titus to do so as well. So it just depends on the situation. You just got to discern that. And Paul's telling towards this audience, rebuke them sharply. So we see that there. <clears throat> and because otherwise, we see that they may be sound in the faith, because you couldn't really go about your life. If you're, if you're allowing people not to be sound in the faith, it, your, your conscience is going to be seared. Your conscience is not going to be happy if you're allowing people that you're teaching to just not grow. If you had the opportunity to, to teach somebody a lesson and you just back off and say, well, I, I don't want to offend them and I don't want to let them learn anything and I really don't want to teach them the revelation of the mystery because they might be offended, then that means you, you're not teaching them. You're not helping them grow. You're not helping them learn. You're not helping them understand. And even if they're saved, you're not helping them have a better day at the judgment seat of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so that's why it's good, as Paul says, if you've got that audience that is rebellious, evil be slow bellies all your life, rebuke them. Rebuke them sharply. Don't make that your entire ministry if you've got a good audience. But if you've got a wicked one, go ahead and, and sharpen them up accordingly. So we're seeing that there in uh, verse 12 and 13. It says that they may be sound in the faith. So they may not be sound in the faith, but this gives them the opportunity to do so. Just because you rebuke them sharply doesn't mean that they'll turn around and instantly be sound in the faith, but that will be an opportunity for them to grow if that's what they're looking to do deep down. So we see that in verse 13. And so when people do say in the grace movement, Paul would never yell, Paul would never rebuke, Paul would never, yes he would. And it says so in Titus. That's just one example. Paul wants people to behave. Paul wants people to come to the knowledge of the truth because that's what God wants. Mm -hmm. And Paul would rebuke if he saw wrong behavior. And so we see this in the book of Titus. So it's all about sharpening up your behavior, sharpening up your audience, sharpening up your understanding as we all continue to come to the knowledge of the truth and teach others to do so as well. So, continuing on what he's stating from verse 13 to 14, he says not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. So we're seeing, you know, essentially we say avoid superstitions. You can hear superstitions. I hear them all the time at work. You can hear them on TV. You can hear them on the radio. You can hear them outside. You can hear them in church, depending on which, which church building you go to. Uh, I know the Roman Catholic uh, religion has a, is all built on superstition. So when we see not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men, 
don't give heed to the commandments of men. Now, it's not talking about at your job or when someone tells you to do something, but concerning, concerning religious commandments or man-made commandments, and they're talking about the Bible, and then it's just a man-made issue. And you can think of an example of uh, Ellen G. White. You know, she's making up man-made commandments as she goes along, using the Bible to do so. Seventh-day Adventism is a lie because it's based on man-made commandments, commandments of men. Roman Catholicism does the same, takes whatever the Pope says, takes whatever a priest says, and makes commandments of men. And so he's saying, don't, uh, don't give heed to any of it. Don't, 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 uh, don't, don't give heed to it. So we see that there. And if we see, it says, in verse 14, commandments of men that turn from the truth. If we look at 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 20, Another thing you'll see aside from commandments of men that are religious is you'll see commandments of men that are scientific, that are really not scientific. They're just blather. They're just commandments of men. They just made stuff up. And so he says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called. You've got more commandments of men there. There's nothing wrong with studying actual science. If you're going to study the weather, you're going to study uh, the earth, you're going to study whatever it is you're going to study, as long as you bring back actual facts. If you're going to go and you're going to make things up and you have no evidence, which there's still no evidence for the Big Bang, there's still no evidence that the earth is really billions and billions and billions of years old, but people will profess that, science falsely so-called. There's no science for that. People are just saying that. So let them say it. They're, or don't let them say that. So they're going to say that, and you have got to oppose that. So, and we see that's why we're seeing in verse um, 12, 13, and 14, uh, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. So they've turned from the truth. At one point, they've heard what the truth was, and they turned from it. So that's why you can go out and rebuke them sharply. And as you hear them say that, you, you, you rebuke them sharply. You let them know. That's, that's not the truth. Mm -hmm. you know, and that's, as you hear that, you, you let them know. So, we see that there. And then going into verse 15, it says, Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and, their, and conscience is defiled. So what we're seeing here concerning, and you can take this verse and apply it to things concerning the Bible rightly divided. So unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. So we've got two audiences that the Apostle Paul has already told Titus about. One is setting up elders, and he gave an excellent good description as who to look out for. And then he gave unruly and vain talkers, you know, look out for them, because you'll come across them too, and he gave a description concerning them and what to do about them. So he's saying, unto the pure, all things are pure. You, you're going to talk to someone about the Bible. You're going to talk to someone about grace. You're going to talk to someone about the grace life. And uh, the Bible rightly divided. It's going to be, unto the pure, all things are pure. He says, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. So you'll come across all sorts of different uh, people who will think that even, even grace is a reason that they can go about uh, sinning. A defiled mind says, well, it's grace. I can live however I feel like. I can do anything I want because this is the dispensation of God's grace. That's a defiled mind that doesn't understand. Paul has commandments for us. Paul has an established way of understanding and living. So you can't live how, how you want to. You were bought with the price. You were bought with the price and there's a way to understand uh, Paul's instructions which are God's instructions. And we can't live the way that we want to. We have to live the way we've been told to. Because we're not even ours. We're his. And so that's how we go about understanding the grace of you. If you want to live however you want, that's the sign of a defiled mind. And we see that in verse 15. Defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. So that's why as we study and we learn, we can grow in the knowledge of the truth and understand what Paul is saying. 
And we see that there. So uh, then we get into verse 16, the continuation of what they're saying. It says, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. So what we're seeing here, it, it's, it's a pretense by those who live as, as the world. Those who say that they're saved, but they live exactly as, as the unsaved. Those who say that they're saved, but they have no desire to, to do 1 Timothy 2.4, have all men saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. What we're seeing is that they profess that they know God. I mean, why wouldn't they profess it? If they, if they uh, you know, say that they're saved, and, and perhaps they are, perhaps they're not, uh, but in works they deny him. So they say that they say they want people to be saved, but in works, but in their works, that if we turn to Ephesians chapter two verse ten, now we're not talking about salvation by works, but Ephesians chapter two verse ten, what we're seeing here is a life with purpose with actual purpose, a godly purpose. It says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So what we're seeing is that in, in Ephesians 2.10, that we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. We're supposed to be doing good works. We're supposed to be doing the works that match up with the Bible rightly divided, the Apostle Paul and his doctrine. Pauline good works. So, as we come back to verse 16, it says, They profess that they know God. And you'll hear so many people say that. You'll hear many unsaved churchgoers say, Well, I go to church every week. You'll hear the, the Catholics say, Well, you know, I, I know God. I love God. I believe God. I know who he is. And, and all this, all these other things that are just meaningless. Mm -hmm. But what he's saying here is he's saying they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him. Because they don't understand the Bible rightly divided. They don't understand what it is they're supposed to be doing. And so they may go out and try to do something that God's not saying to do. And so they'll go out and try to do some sort of work, but it's their own kind of work. And it's nothing, God never tells anyone to go out and heal anybody, because you can't do it today. But people are going to try to say, but by my works, I'm out there healing. It's not happening. And that's not what they're supposed to be doing. That's what they can't do in the first place. Otherwise, you know, they're, they're studying the Bible incorrectly. And it proves them as such. It proves them as liars. So we're seeing, we're seeing this here in Titus chapter 1, verse 16. They profess that they know God. So many people will do that. But in works they deny him being abominable and disobedient, not to every good work reprobate. So we're seeing three descriptions of who these people are. So we're seeing those who, are, who have a defiled and, un, defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. So they've got a defiled mind, defiled conscience, and they'll still profess that they, they know God. And by their works, they'll deny him. And he says, being abominable, that's number one. So if we look at Job chapter 15, verse 16, we'll get a, a, a Bible cross-reference to abominable. Job 15, verse 16. Job chapter 15 and verse 16, what that says here is, How much more abominable and filthy is man, which drinketh iniquity like water. So we're seeing that as a description in the book of Job, verse 15, or chapter 15, verse 16. How much more abominable and filthy is man, which drinketh iniquity like water. So we see that, we see that here. Then when he says, and disobedient. If we look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 6, we'll get a better description for disobedient, or a cross-reference. In Ephesians chapter 5, and verse 6, what we're going to see there is a better cross-reference, or description for disobedience. So what we're seeing in Ephesians 5, 6, it says, Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. 
So we're seeing that the very people who are not saved and have come to the knowledge of the truth and have trusted the gospel and are understanding the word of God right and the divine are called the children of disobedience. That's their title. Those who are unsaved are living in disobedience. They're walking in disobedience. They're the very children of disobedience. And that's their title. That's essentially how God sees their position, is that they're just the children of disobedience. Anyone who's not saved today is a child of disobedience. And so as we come back to Titus chapter 1, verse 16, they're being abominable, drinking inequity like water. They're disobedient. They're the very ch child of disobedience. And this is an unto every good work reprobate. If we look at 2 Timothy 3 8. We're going to see an Old Testament example that Paul uses to teach Timothy. And what we'll see here it says, Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. So we're seeing that word explained again, reprobate, uh, concerning the faith. And so we see that as this uh, chapter comes to a close, we're seeing this explanation taught about what Paul warns Titus about. He tells Titus, you know, you care for two things, set up elders and ordain elders in every city and fill up that which is lacking, fill up that which is walking. Here's the good guys you need to look out for. Here's their description. And here are some unru unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they have circumcision, that you need to be looking out for. They'll profess that they know God, but their conscience is defiled. Their mind is defiled. And every time they profess that they know God in their very works, they deny him, being abominable and disobedient. And in every good work, they're completely reprobate. So they, they couldn't serve God if they tried, in other words. They don't know him. They don't understand him. And Titus, that's why you're here, to set up elders, to help teach others, to teach others, to teach others. Because you've got people on, on the island of Crete, which we also have here in Central Florida, who profess that they know God, who profess that they understand God, and they don't understand anything. And they're doing all the wrong works, and they're taking all the wrong Bible verses, and they're doing all the wrong things, saying all the while that they know God and they love God. And they don't even know what's going on. So, as we come to a close with this one, we'll stop here, and we'll pick up next time uh, with the book of Titus. Uh, so now we'll, uh, if there's no questions, we'll close in a word of prayer, and uh, we'll pick up next time. No, no questions? You're okay? Okay. So, what we'll do is we'll close in a word of prayer, and then we'll continue next time. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're thankful that we can study your word and understand uh, as... As, as your word talks about, that there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers. We can be aware of that. We can rebuke them with sound doctrine, and we can rebuke them sharply. Lord, we're thankful we can go forth and uh, understand your grace, mercy, and peace with the ministry of reconciliation that we have to go forth and go out and see souls saved for your glory. We're thankful for these opportunities by your grace. Amen. Amen.